Oh, sorry, everyone. I didn't realize we'd gone live. Uh, sorry, we're a little bit late on there. A few technical issues, but I am here with Professor Richard Murphy. Hi, Richard. Hello. Uh, and we are going to talk about a wealth tax. Now, the idea of a wealth tax has been thrust back into our newspapers after Rachel Reeves, Labour's shadow chancellor, uh, in an interview with The Telegraph over the weekend, she she ruled it out, basically. She said that if a Labour government does does come in after the next general election, which is widely expected, then they have no plans for a wealth tax. Now, this was yet another U-turn from Labour, as uh, Reeves had said uh, two years before in an interview with The Sunday Times, that I do think people who get their income through wealth should have to pay more. So before we get into the more nitty gritty, the the whether we should support it or oppose it or whatever that might be, Richard, what what exactly is a wealth tax? Look, a wealth tax is basically one of two sorts. You can either do a one-off wealth tax, and some people are talking about those at the moment, or you can do an annual wealth tax. What I stress is it's not inheritance tax, which is a gifts tax. Now, admittedly, a gift, a, a, a tax on gifts made out of wealth, but it's not a wealth tax. A wealth tax basically says, tot up all your wealth at this moment of time, tell HM Revenue and Customs what it is, and they will charge you to a fixed percentage, probably a fixed percentage, could be an increasing percentage depending upon how much you've got above a set limit. That could be a million, that could be two million, some people talk about five million, and the percentage they talk about could be one percent, two percent, and I have heard up to five percent, but again that would be on the very wealthy. And the idea is to actually basically collect part of that wealth as a tax revenue because the evidence is very strong that wealth has been rising pretty heavily over the last decade or more in the UK as a whole. Um, data for Scotland not nearly so clear um, for the UK as a whole. So what people call wealth taxes are a little vague. I say either annual or one-off, always above a bottom level which most people won't reach let's be clear about it most people will never be impacted by a wealth tax most people haven't got wealth of a million um in london they might have if they own a house but in scotland this is relatively unusual and anyway it's very often set at more than a million quite often two million or so so it's a small annual charge let's just give an example of this Suppose the wealth tax was set as being 1% of wealth over £2 million, and a person had £2.1 million of wealth, and the tax was at 1%, then they'd pay £1,000 in wealth tax per year. So we're not talking about megabucks for somebody who's worth two, bill, 2 million quid, but it is an extra tax revenue. So presumably in order to get the, the total wealth that a person had, you have to add together all their assets if they own their car outright, if they own their house outright. If they're... This is the problem. What is wealth? And it is a really big problem. According to the Office for National Statistics, who prepare the statistics for UK household wealth, there's a bit over 15 trillion pounds of wealth in the UK at present. And I'm using some round numbers, and these numbers, by the way, are out of date. They're 2020 numbers, 2020 numbers, but they're, they're, they're the best we've got right now. So coming on for six trillion of that is pension funds. Now, are you going to charge a wealth tax on pension funds when you give tax relief to encourage people to put money into a pension fund? That's a difficult question to answer. Nearly five um, billion of a trillion of this is property, a lot of which will be people's homes. Um, again, quite a difficult question to answer whether you are actually going to charge a wealth tax on most homes, because we actually do enjoy tax relief on owning homes in the UK. We don't pay capital gains tax on owning our own house. So a difficult one again. There's 1.3, 1.4 trillion pounds worth of personal chattels. Um, you know, everything from that mug is a personal chattel. I own it. It's in my household. Um, the car sitting outside that window, which is illuminating that side of my face, is um, a personal chattel. And yeah, I own it. Um, yeah, about four grand, that one, I reckon, at most. But that's mine. 
Um, so I'd add it into my total and, you know, uh, I live in a house, um, so I'd add that into the total. I'd take off the value of the mortgage because that would be fair because I don't own that part of the house. So you add all that up and come to a figure. Plus, how much is that book collection behind me worth? Um, now, your guess is as good as mine. There are mm. quite a lot of books in my house, um, several thousand. I know they cost a fortune to insure because... If you aren't aware of it, you actually have to insure the value of books in your house. Um, otherwise, you've underinsured the contents. Um, 40 to 50 grand, I reckon, my books have cost me over the last 40 to 50 years. That's how long I've been accumulating books over now. So, you know, that's part of my wealth. Do I have to pay tax on that? All of these are very difficult questions, but they also are incredibly difficult when it comes to value. And I think that's the point that most people don't understand to talking about wealth taxes. So how much is a person really worth when you come down to the detail of literally what is that book collection worth? Uh, <laughs> I suppose the, the typical answer is as much as someone will pay for it. Precisely. But how much will somebody pay for my secondhand copy of whatever some of those books are? I mean, the answer in some cases is not a lot. In some cases, it might be quite a lot. Um, you know, I paid a significant amount for some books that I've really wanted to own. And frankly, some of those, if they were worth a quid, um, I'd be surprised, um, you know, why I still got them, I sometimes wonder, um, except for sort of nostalgia's sake in some cases. But what I want to stress is this. If you're going to have a wealth tax, you've got to have a reliable way of valuing wealth. Now, as I've mentioned in my column in The National today, um, I don't know whether it's up yet. Um, Zach, no, it, it will be going live at 4 p.m. Uh, right, at, at so you could read this. And I'll give you a trailer of what I say in my column today then. I point out the difficulty of valuation. You know, I live in a house which is on a modern development. Um, uh, so it's not going to be very hard to work out what the value of my house is within 10, 15,000 quid or so. I mean, literally that margin for error, depending on whether I've repainted it and God knows what else, yeah, that sort of thing. Um, but it's going to be pretty easy to establish on Zoopla or Rightmove or whoever else. So that's not going to be a great issue for anyone. Um, if I owned a portfolio of shares, I don't. But if I did, um, I could open the Financial Times and get a value for them. Um, but um, I do actually own um, a private company. Um, it's called Tax Research LLP. It's what I use to publish my blog and so on. How much is that worth? I don't know. Has it got any worth? I mean, it makes money, but it only makes money because I run it. Um, is there a value attributable to it? Some people would say, yeah. I would say, probably not a lot. Uh, mysteriously, the revenue might say, yeah, there's a value attached to it. And I'd say, not a lot. And we wouldn't agree with each other. Um, and again, I might say the books are worth 25,000 quid. And they'll say, no, there's a valuable collection in there of related uh, stuff, which is really important and therefore adds to the overall value of the thing. And therefore it's worth 50,000 quid. Now, my point is, we don't know the answers to those questions. And frankly, no one does. I have no intention of putting my books up for sale. I have no intention of moving. I have no intention of selling tax research, LLP, etc. So we don't know what the price of these things is. And agreeing that for everybody in the UK who might come even close to being subject to a wealth tax, which is what some people are now proposing, would be, let's call it the proverbial nightmare. There isn't the resource within HM revenue and customs to deal with it. And I've heard people say, well, look, you know, just tax the value that people want to attribute to their own assets on the basis that if they undervalue them, the state can buy them at the undervalued sum. So I could put my house on as being worth one quid, but then I'd have to be willing to sell it to the government for one pound um, for having done so. Now, look, that's not socially fair. That's not social justice. It's contrary to human rights. So you can't say that sort of thing. You can't tax on that sort of arbitrary basis. So the point I'm making is that I think there's a real problem here. So um, I actually personally, based upon my experience as an accountant, which I've been now for over 40 years and having done many complex tax cases with HM Revenue and Customs, because although I'm a professor, though I'm a campaigner, though I'm a journalist on the national and elsewhere, I actually still am a practicing chartered accountant. I know just how difficult it is to agree valuations mm -hmm. for tax purposes. And I think that for that reason, I've got real problems with the idea of a wealth tax, but I don't. And I stress the point, 
I don't have a problem with taxing wealth more. In fact, I'm incredibly keen that we do tax wealth more. Now, how, how can we do that if not through a wealth tax? Well, I've been working the whole of this summer on that issue. Um, sad but true, um, I've been working extremely hard on developing a whole series of proposals on this very issue. Um, before Rachel Reeves made her comment, before Lucy Powell MP, another shadow uh, minister for Labour, said there is no money left, which made me despair uh, for the lack of economic understanding that it implied and for the fact that it was so similar to what Liam Byrne MP said in 2010 to the Tories, which they used against Labour ever since. Um, what I've done is look at something much easier than a wealth tax. And that is to change the existing tax system, to identify the loopholes and abuses and ways in which the wealthy don't pay tax. And actually, I've now come up with over 30 recommendations for change to the existing tax system, which could raise, I suspect, vastly more than a wealth tax could. My estimate of the total amount of tax that the wealthy save compared to those who are on low incomes. In other words, if they pay tax on their income and their increases in wealth at the same rate as those who are in the lowest 10 to 20 percent of income earners, I reckon they are underpaying tax by 170 billion pounds a year which is roughly 20% of the total tax paid in the UK. That's how much tax we are talking about, underpaid by the wealthy. So we've got to find ways to collect that. And I'll, I'll give you one example of the 30 that I've come up with, all of which are priced based upon data from HM Revenue and Customs. So you can't accuse me of getting the numbers wrong because I'm using HM Revenue and Customs numbers. Suppose we did something which is very simple, very straightforward and entirely fair. And that is say, that somebody who's a higher rate taxpayer should not get a higher rate of tax relief on the contribution that they make to their pension fund than somebody who is on the standard rate of income tax, 20%. So let's take a 40% taxpayer and hands up, I'm a 40% taxpayer. Um, it's not desperately surprising to find out that a university professor might be a 40% taxpayer because of what we're paid. And now, why should I get a tax relief of 40% if I make a pension contribution, but a lecturer who's on basic rate tax only gets a 20% subsidy for their contribution to a pension fund? I think that's completely unfair. I don't see why the wealthy should get a higher degree of subsidy for their savings than those on lower income. In fact, if anything, it should be the other way round, of course. But it isn't. That's the way that it is at the moment. The wealthy are subsidised more. If we took away that subsidy for the wealthiest people in this country who are making contributions to pension funds, we would save, in my estimate, £14.5 billion pounds a year. Just now, from, that, uh, from that single intervention? That single intervention. That's one. I've got 29 more to come. Mm. Okay. Yes, so and let's put that in context. The TUC put out a, port, a report recently, which is probably what provoked um, Rachel Reeves' reaction. And they were talking about doing a one-off wealth tax to raise £10 billion. I don't need any of that hassle that that wealth tax would create. I can do it all by one simple change to one tax rule. So why go through the process of having a really complicated wealth tax when actually we can have one simple change. Adam Smith, um, you know, that first ever economist in the world, of course, a Scot, um, said that taxes should be efficient. I'm proposing an efficient way of collecting more money from the wealthy, and I'm afraid wealth taxes simply aren't efficient ways of collecting money from the wealthiest people. The, um, the Wealth Tax Commission, which uh, concluded in December 2020, just the... Uh, as, as Richard said, his, his 30 proposals could raise 170 billion per year. No, I can the say they'd raise 170. I think that's what the target is. Oh, I okay. Think, sorry. I don't think anyone will raise 170 billion. I'm going to identify 50 plus billion pounds worth of opportunity. But um, I, and I do know the work of the Wealth Tax Commission. But no, I'm not saying we could collect 100 and. Um, 70 billion a year. I don't believe that's plausible, but I think we could raise at least 50 billion extra a year. Right. So, yes, yeah, so the Wealth Tax Commission said that a wealth tax on uh, 
well, it's, it would be a 5% rate on anything above 500,000 over five years. So a person would be paying 1% of their wealth over 500,000 every year for five years. Uh, they said that would raise uh, 260 billion over five years or a wealth tax uh, the same. So 5%, 1% a year over five years on any wealth over 2 million would raise 80 billion over over five years. So yeah, uh, not not hugely significant numbers, really. Eighty billion over over five years. Well, I don't see why you do a one-off tax for a start. I, I never did understand that. I know the people who wrote that report, in particular Emma Chamberlain, who's a tax barrister, but plus two tax academics from Warwick University, basically. Now, first of all, Emma might be a tax barrister, but she's never really done frontline tax in the sense of having to negotiate the nitty-gritty with the revenue. She's a theoretician. She's a tax counsel. Um, and the two guys from Warwick, you know, very good academics, but I'm afraid actually a little removed from the reality, which I've been in touch with, of being a tax practitioner and so these theories are great but actually just because there is a number for the value of total assets available inside the economy doesn't mean to say we can identify who has them precisely and how much they should pay but you'll notice that they've in fact that their figure of 50 billion a year for five years is pretty close to the target i've got only i'm trying to come up with that in a very very much simpler more targeted and fairer way there's a lot of people who've got assets of five hundred thousand pounds because they are age 60 they paid off their mortgage and their house has gone up in value substantially since they bought it in 1980 which is a very common scenario um, who won't necessarily actually have the cash flow to pay the tax that they're demanding I'm talking about making sure that we actually also impose a tax on people who've got the cash flow to make the payment. And that means we don't need to go into hardship situations and worry about the typical wealth tax concern, which is, I mean, I, I don't want to be too stereotypical here, but it tends to be there's the little old granny sitting in the enormous old family house who has a very low pension income, but obviously sitting in a house of great worth and clearly can't pay any more as a result, but would be subject to a wealth tax. Now, that is the stereotype. Um, um, of course, it doesn't need to be a granny. It could be a granddad, but it's going to be somebody old and they haven't got a big income. Now, I, I, we, we just need to avoid that problem altogether by charging on income from wealth. And the whole system at the moment is deeply unfair. Let's be clear about this. Capital gains are charged at half the rate of tax on income. Why? It's still a pound in your pocket. Why, if you get it from a capital gain, are you going to pay half what you do when you get it from work? Why is it worth any more or less to you? It's still a pound in your pocket. Um, so you can guess what another one of my recommendations is going to be on that one. Um, <laughs> but there's also other ridiculous quirks. Um, there's no national insurance on rent or on dividends or on interest or anything like that. Why is it that when you work, you pay a national insurance charge, which actually between the employee and the employer can be up to 26 percent um, tax near enough um, when there's no such charge on unearned income? This is, again, absurd. Mm -hmm. um, all of this is penalizing the person who has to work for a living and who's by and large on lower income. So what we need to do is get rid of these wrinkles inside um, the tax system. But there are plenty. I'm looking at income tax corporation tax, capital gains tax, national insurance, corporation tax, um, inheritance tax, council tax, and the administration of tax in my work to come up with these systems. And I've got changes, at least three in every one of those areas. So we really are talking about a lot. By the way, I'm not looking so much at the Scottish council tax system. I've focused on England because that's where my biggest audience is going to be. But I'll probably add a Scottish version in due course. So um, the Wealth Tax Commission, when I was looking through it earlier, it did say that uh, I'm just going to look at this Hashbury stumble for a question they've put in the comments on YouTube. Um, it did say in the Wealth, the wealth Tax Commission, not Welsh, that um, a wealth tax would need to not be announced beforehand to prevent people kind of hiding it away or even emigrating to avoid this wealth tax. Now, that ties in with what Hashbury Stumble, which I assume isn't the real name, has written on YouTube. Uh, they said, would a wealth tax in an independent Scotland not lead uh, the rest of the UK, like capital flight to the rest of the UK? Um, would the UK as a whole see that as well, do you think, if there was a, a big announcement that the government was going to bring in a one-off wealth tax? Is it likely that people would move a lot of their assets offshore? No. Um, if you had asked me that question a decade ago, I'd have said, Yes, that's a problem. 
but I spent a very long time working on this issue um, when I was heavily involved in the tax justice movement and was heavily involved in negotiating changes to international tax agreements. I spent quite a lot of time in Paris in 2012, 13, 14. Somebody had to go. It turned out it was me. Um, dealing with these sorts of issues and the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which sets the rules for international tax, put in place something called automatic information exchange between countries. And that means that a bank in one country who provides, or, or I mean, it doesn't have to be a bank, it could be a life insurance company, it could be an investment fund, it could be an accountant, it could be a lawyer. All of those people who are subject to regulation or financial services, if they supply services to a person who's tax resident in another country, has to report the details of the assets and the income that arises to that person resident in another country so that the information can be sent to them. So, for example, if, and we would logically, logically expect this to be the case, an independent Scotland agreed such a deal with England or the rest of the UK, whatever it's going to be called, uh, when Scotland has left, then HMRC in London would be duty bound to collect information from you know, Barclays in the rest of the UK on the money that has been hidden there by whoever it might be from Scotland and send that detail back to Revenue Scotland so that Revenue Scotland knows that the money is there. And that is also true, by the way, of the Cayman Islands and it's true of Jersey and it's true of all these other tax havens. And most of them are now reasonably cooperating. So the chance of really seeing major capital flight is now something that is moving into the past. Um, and is becoming a bit irrelevant in this context. Will people leave because of this? Yeah. How many? Count the fingers of two hands, probably. I mean, you've got to be a really sad git. That's a technical term. You've got to be a really sad git to actually move from Scotland to the Cayman Islands to avoid tax, because it's a really miserable place to live. Um, I mean, I hate to tell you, but most of the Caribbean islands are really miserable places to live. Um, um, and subject to all sorts of massive social problems. So it's just not going to happen. Or if you want to move to Jersey, yeah, go and buy your Porsche on Jersey, maximum speed, 40 miles an hour. Um, you, know, you just don't want to go and live on these places. They're boring. So it doesn't happen. The evidence is very strong. People don't leave. And in fact, actually, the guys who did the Wealth Commission work also did that. They examined very large numbers of tax returns of wealthy people when there were major changes in tax rate in the UK and found nobody really goes. A few mm -hmm. can yell and scream and shout, but they're a tiny part of the whole. We don't need to worry about it. So uh, I think this is what DJ Marty's question has come up now. I think this is what they're trying to ask. So um, would it be possible with or through a wealth tax to target money that is offshore that has been put into these tax havens? Well, the money actually in tax havens now is very largely reported, as I say, from the tax havens to the local tax authority of the place where the person is really resident. So, I mean, you know, Marty, if you want to go and try and put your money into Jersey and think that you don't have to put the interest that you earn on your tax return, good luck, because I think you're probably going to find that the revenue are going to be in touch with you sometime, saying, um, I think there might be something missing. And how will they know? It's because... The bank, whoever you choose in Jersey, would have actually told HM Revenue and Customs, who will then come knocking on your door and saying, hey, you haven't put this on your tax return, you might owe us money. So mm -hmm. there is, I mean, I'm not saying it will be quick, I'm not saying it'll be overnight, you might think you've got a waiver with it for three or four, or even five years, but eventually I think they'll come knocking. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of evidence that they are certainly focusing on the high net worth people now in a big way to make sure that this is really happening. And the message is creeping down that you just can't get away with this anymore. And in fairness, it is also true that most of those obviously accessible tax havens, you know, places like Jersey, Guernsey, Isle of Man, who I spent a long time absolutely you know, in conflict with because they were at one point so dirty with regard to their tax affairs. They have tidied it up. They don't want money from the UK anymore. It's far too much hassle to take on money from the UK in these places now because the amount of paperwork they've got to do to send this information back to the UK tax authorities, they can't be bothered. So this is not anymore a big issue. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but it's not a big issue anymore. This money is now traceable. So to sum up, I'm aware that we've been uh, talking for quite a while now, a bit longer than I was maybe expecting to, uh, but to sum up then, so a wealth tax, uh, you would have to get everybody in the country to declare their, their 
wealth, which we, we've established would be extremely, extremely difficult because you'd have to value everything you owned. And again, uh, I think you mentioned in your column that it would also be extremely litigious, like uh, people might not like might not like the uh, valuations, the Home Office might not like yeah, the Yeah, this is a really big issue, actually, because yeah. the people who are going to pay the most wealth tax, of course, are the people who've got the most money. And oddly enough, they have the most expensive lawyers, and they're going to hire them to say, I don't agree with what the revenue want to charge me to tax on. I don't agree that my racehorse is worth half a million. It hasn't run for two years. It's only got three legs now, and I don't think it's worth that much. Um, you know, the fact that it's actually siring vast numbers of new horses, um, or whatever else, well, we'll ignore that. Now, the point is, this is so subjective that it will just be full of litigation. Mm -hmm. I think the revenue could be ground to a halt by the amount of resources that it would require to just manage wealth disputes, um, mm -hmm. even though we won't be talking about vast numbers of people. The, this is really, really difficult stuff. I mean, I've done it. An investigation of this sort, by the way, normally lasts years. I mean, we are talking years. I've just closed a tax investigation that lasted five years. That's not uncommon. So this is really expensive, difficult, stressful, hard work for the revenue, hard work for the person. Why don't we find an easier way to do it? That's why I'm suggesting let's change the rules on income tax, capital gains tax, etc. Um, make those more effective rather than impose a wealth tax. And yeah. at the same time, raise a lot more money, which is what I'm interested in doing. Yeah, I mean, it sounds it sounds like a fair point. I, I have to say, I said to you before before we came on, Richard, I was surprised that you were not pro wealth tax as an economist on the left. It does seem like something that you would you would gravitate towards, but a very very convincing argument uh, to the contrary. As as we have mentioned, Richard will have a column live on our website in about half an hour now, uh, so at four o'clock, where he explains explains his position why he does not think there should be a wealth tax in the UK. Covers some of the points that we've covered here uh, in a little bit more detail. Um, so yeah, uh, we will continue to cover the wealth tax and well, these taxation issues as a whole moving forward. I mean, we've we've got more stories today on the website about Labour, Scottish Labour and uh, Hamza Yousaf's potential idea of increasing tax. Obviously there's council tax increases on the horizon as well it looks like the issue of trying to get the wealthier to pay a little bit more is not going away anytime soon so i'm sure the issue of a wealth tax won't either so no, yeah I, I, and we should keep it labor because bluntly labor is really failing by not picking this issue up i wish it would it's so easy for it to address these problems and act for the benefit of people can i add one final point if i raise 50 billion I really think that we should be using some of that to cut the tax rates on those who are on lowest earnings. So I don't think a wealth tax is all for extra spendings. I think some of it is simply to actually really seriously redistribute. Mm. But that's also important because when you redistribute wealth to the people who earn least in society, they go and spend it. And if they go and spend it, you give an economic boost to the economy. And that is in itself a massive source of new tax revenue. So I actually am not just talking about let's spend 50 billion extra. If I can find extra 50 billion, I'm saying let's cut some taxes to match the increased ones on wealth. Because at the moment, frankly, the wealthy don't pay much different from anybody else apart from those on low earnings who pay more. And that's just wrong. Just wrong. It's very much the economic orthodoxy that we hear from from the, the mainstream media a lot is that tax cuts for the rich will help stimulate the economy more, but maybe maybe tax cuts for the poor could help stimulate Absolutely. the economy. That's the only more. tax cuts that work. Tax cuts for the rich have never, ever stimulated an economy. Uh, they just save it. And saving does not stimulate the economy doesn't do anything for the economy. The money's taken out of circulation. It's put in the cupboard, put away. It doesn't do anything, basically. So that's hopeless for the economy. But giving money to the people who'll spend it, that's what stimulates the economy. So the conventional economic logic on these things is just wrong. Yeah, and on that, we will we will leave you. So yes, thanks so much for your time, Richard. As I said before, and we'll say again now, look out for his column on The National. That's in 25 minutes now at four o'clock. And thanks very much, everybody, for joining us. I'm going to try and put a stop to this now. Yes.